Hello everyone and welcome to the NSTA web seminars where you can find live interactive learning at your desktop. Today's seminar is titled The Science of Modern Agriculture, GMOs, a discussion in the media, the classroom, and at the dinner table. My name is Carolyn Moore and I will be moderating today's program. Don Boonster is online with us to provide technical support. And our presenters today are Valerie Bays, Larry Gilbertson, and Lisa Canizé. Lisa Canizé holds a PhD in plant biology and joined Monsanto in 2014. Dr. Larry Gilbertson joined Monsanto's biotechnology organization in 1971 and is the genomic strategy lead in the research and de development group at Monsanto. And Valerie Bays is Monsanto's STEM engagement lead in St. Louis, Missouri. She's a strong advocate for the scientific method and focuses on creating authentic agricultural experiences. And now I will turn the microphone over to Valerie. Welcome, Valerie. Hello. Thank you for hosting us this evening. Um, this is our first time doing this, so if I mess up on advancing the slides, I am very sorry. Um, so this is the first part of a five-part series kind of explaining different aspects in agriculture, the sophistication of modern agriculture. This first series we're going to be talking, for the first um, webinar we're going to be talking about GMOs. Um, for the second one we're going to be talking about insects and uh, insect pests. Um, the next one will be all about crop protection and chemistries in agriculture. The next one will be about engineering and some of the sophistication uh, involved there. And then the last one we actually have kind of open because depending on how the other four go, we're going to determine uh, what we want to focus on most depending on what questions re we receive from everybody. And that leads us up to um, the March National Conference. Now some of you are probably wondering why would a company like Monsanto decide to do a, a series like this? Um, and I want to give you a little bit of background. So Monsanto is an agriculture company. We sell products to farmers. Um, we're also a publicly traded company, so we talk to shareholders. And for a long time, we only really talked to those two, those two audiences. But we realized about four years ago that, you know, people are really curious about where their food comes from and how it's produced. And we maybe didn't do the best job of telling kind of the general public and consumers um, about those things or explaining some of the technologies that we were developing. So we've been going out and giving presentations at universities, libraries, um, education conferences like NSTA and trying new things like webinars to try and help um, the general public ask questions, make our experts themselves available to answer them. And if we don't know the answers to the questions, we're always good about getting back to people. So how many of you are going to be at the NSTA National Conference this year? So my friends, there is a, a green check mark showing up underneath your name. Feel free to click on the green check mark for yes or the red X for no. All right, so we have a couple of folks who are going to be going to the national conference. Um, we'll be at the national conference. We'll have a booth there. We'll also have a couple of breakout sessions. Um, so feel free to stop by our booth. You know, we are open to answer the questions that you have. We will also be there with um, classroom resources for you, some seed packets, and, and things like that. All right. So next generation science standards. Um, I was originally going to kind of highlight some of the topic areas that I think uh, modern agriculture ties really nicely to, but this might be a great opportunity for you all to be engaged. So if you could um, activate kind of the check mark or X clip art and mark where you think some of the um, topic areas that cover modern agriculture are, um, I'd be interested to see where you put those marks. Okay, so my friends, if you recall, that long skinny uh, rectangular box is your toolbox, and at the very bottom is the clip art, and um, Valerie would like you to use that to uh, mark where you're at and the chart that she has on there. Looks like some of you are finding it. Good job. Yeah, that's wonderful.
Great. So I think Larry, Lisa, and I would agree with where we're seeing these check marks go. And I think you guys can start to tell that um, a lot of these check marks are kind of covering a whole bunch of different topics. So we would love to see modern agriculture concepts um, uh, infused into science curriculum a little bit more because, you know, it's great to talk about the genetics and inheritance of, say, dogs or humans, but there's a great opportunity to also talk about plants and insects and um, weather and climate as it relates to producing food, fuel, and fiber, um, everything from sensors and drones um, and the technologies that are used in agriculture. We see a lot of opportunity to tie um, these concepts to the next generation science standards. So we have a lot to cover this evening. Um, we will have a couple of question breaks during um, the slides. Um, and then at the very end, we'll open it up for an open discussion. So as I said, my name is Valerie Bays. Um, my background is in biological science. I went to the University of Missouri, Columbia. Um, I thought that I wanted to, to be a dentist. I wanted to go to dental school. And I realized my last semester of university um, that I was not as passionate about oral health as I once thought. So what would I be doing with this degree in biology? Um, started working for a data science company where I was basically the middle person between the people conducting clinical trial studies um, and pharmaceutical companies, and that just really wasn't my thing. And anytime I go out and speak to students um, through our outreach program, I always tell them that knowing what you don't want to do or don't like to do is just as valuable as knowing what you do like to do. Um, that let, then led me to a friend who had worked at this company called Monsanto, and even though I'm born and raised in St. Louis, Missouri, I actually had never heard of the company. Um, so I started doing um, a little bit of internet research, and as you can imagine, I was, uh, I was a little bit taken aback. Um, so I started investigating a little further, you know, what, what does this company actually do? And what I realized was, wow, you know, I would love to actually be a part of that company and learn more about the sophistication of agriculture and kind of marry my love for science um, and my background in education. Uh, I forgot to mention that between that time, I went back to school and got my master's in education and certification in secondary biology. Um, so now I am the Montana STEM Education Outreach Lead, and I help to connect really smart people like Larry and Lisa to classrooms uh, and teachers all around the country. Larry? Hi, everybody. This is Larry Gilbertson. I'm very happy to be here talking with you tonight. Um, I'm from Iowa, uh, but I'm not, I never had an agricultural background before I came to Monsanto. I, I grew up in Iowa, and I went to the University of Iowa, and whereas Val was going to be a dentist, I was going to be a doctor. I was going to go to medical school, and like most people going to medical school, I took a lot of biology classes, and I started doing some research in a lab because I thought it would help me get into medical school. But while I was doing that research, I fell in love with science, and I fell in love with doing research. So I changed my plans and decided that I wanted to be a professional scientist. So after I graduated at Iowa, I went uh, to University of Oregon to get a PhD in molecular biology. And as I was getting uh, close to ending there, I was trying to decide where I would go after that. And I never thought I would ever want to go work at a company or anything like that, but I was curious. So I thought I would try out this um, this job at a place called Monsanto. I hadn't really heard of Monsanto either, but I thought I'd give it a try. And um, quite frankly, I was kind of skeptical when I went there. I didn't think I would like it. I thought I'd try it for a year or two and then go someplace else. But within a couple of weeks of being there, I found myself surrounded by scientists who were a lot like me. They loved science. They were passionate about what they were doing. They worked hard. Um, and I was super happy there. And there's, I haven't uh, looked back since. So I, I think when Carolyn was introducing me, she said I'd been there since 1971. Not quite that long. It's actually been only since 95. So I've been there uh, for 22 years. And almost all of that time, I worked in the part called biotechnology. And what that means is that's the part of the company that makes GMOs. So if you've ever wanted to talk and ask questions to uh, talk with and ask questions to a person who makes GMOs, you're in luck. 
because that's what I've been doing for about the last 22 years, and we'll talk more about that later. Anyway, I'm really happy to be here with you tonight and uh, look forward to our, our, your questions later. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Lisa. I uh, went to graduate school at the University of Georgia, but I grew up um, in Colorado. Uh, when I was applying to graduate school, I didn't really uh, intend necessarily to go into agriculture or even into plants. In fact, the University of Georgia was the only plant graduate program that I applied to. Um, and the more I the more I learned once I started that program, the more interested in plants I became. Um, I always enjoyed being outside and being in nature, um, and studying plants kind of allowed me to, to merge like my professional interests with my um, personal interests. So I've, I've really enjoyed that. Um, like Carolyn said when she introduced me, I've been at Monsanto for um, almost three years now. And um, I work in the organization called Breeding. Um, this is an organization that works on making like the basic genetics of all the seeds we sell really good. So um, we, like I personally, don't um, work with making GMOs, uh, which is kind of interesting because before I came to Monsanto, uh, when I was doing my postdoc, I did make GMOs um, in soybean in an academic lab, um, but since I've been at Monsanto and breeding, I don't work on GMOs, but I do work really closely with people like Larry um, who do work on those things um, because like we as a company need to, you know, make sure we're developing really good base genetics and also make sure that those genetics um, work well with the different traits that we want to put on the market. Um, and I also am really excited to be here and talk to everyone, and I am looking forward to everyone's questions. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Lisa. So really quickly, we just wanted to um, highlight a new documentary that has recently come out called Food Evolution. Um, it was commissioned by an organization called the Institute of Food Technologists, and it was developed independently by a um, director named Scott Hamilton Kennedy. Uh, the narrator is probably someone that you all are really familiar with, um, Neil deGrasse Tyson. Um, and personally, I thought that this documentary was definitely um, worth the watch. Um, I think it took a very pragmatic view, not only um, as it relates to agriculture in the United States, but really agriculture uh, around the globe. Um, so those are some of the links that you can go to if, you, if you'd like to watch the trailer. It's available for streaming on um, Hulu and YouTube and some other platforms. Um, I do know that they, uh, the Institute for Food Technologists are collaborating with another organization called USFRA, which stands for the United States Farmers and Ranchers Alliance, um, and Discovery Education to try and uh, come up or create uh, some curriculum that is aligned to next generation science standards and the film. So we wanted to, to highlight that for you all. All right, really quick, sort of this anticipatory set. Um, typically when we do this in a classroom setting, we'll have people vote with sticky notes and then we'll have um, the different types of, or the different applications of biotechnology kind of plastered around the walls and then it allows students to get up and move and then cast their votes. So typically they would be able to vote for all of the different applications that they'd want to, uh, if they wanted to, but in this situation we're just going to vote for one um, one application. So go ahead and So ask participants, your vote. if you recall where the uh, A letter A is underneath your name, there's five choices there. Go ahead and uh, record your choice and then I'll record a published results for you in just a second, Valerie. Great, thank you. And insect control consists of things like, um, you know, controlling mosquitoes that may have Zika and transfer Zika. If you haven't found that polling button yet, it's right underneath your name. It's the fourth tab over uh, from the smiley face. 
I'll give everybody a few more seconds and then I will um, close the poll and report what everybody is saying. All right, I'm going to close the poll. And I will try to get those up for you. There we go. Can you see that, Valerie? I do, yes. I see that. Okay, so yeah, this is actually um, uh, a, a good reflection of what happens in the classroom, too. Um, before we start presenting on the topic, we get a lot of votes for cancer treatments, and we definitely agree. Um, hopefully by the end of this presentation, you'll have a little bit better understanding of some of the other uh, applications of, of biotechnology as well. Now, when we look out at these pictures, um, we may see different things. And I don't know if your background is in agriculture or not. My background was not in agriculture. Um, but to the untrained eye, you may not see some of the challenges uh, that are here. Um, but when a agriculturalist, an agronomist, a plant biologist, um, whoever it may be, when they look out at this, they see things like soil compaction, drought, insect pests, disease, um, and other pathogens. They see high weed pressure. These are all challenges that farmers face. Um, and there are different technologies that they can adapt to try and mitigate some of this risk. Um, but we're going to go into a little bit about, you know, what is the shape of, of the bigger problem as it relates to producing food, fuel, and fiber. Okay, so let's talk about the need for some of the things we're going to talk about uh, later. Um, everybody knows that the uh, population of the Earth is, is growing, and it's growing quickly. And by the year 2050, there is projected to be um, more than nine and a half billion people on Earth. That's a lot of new people to feed compared to now. Um, and so a lot of people realize that, but there are other pressures that are uh, putting some stress on food production systems, including the changing climate, and that can manifest in many ways. Of course, things like drought, uh, but also sometimes too much rain or storms, or shifting uh, climate can change the, the pest pressure, so pests that were not a problem in certain uh, agricultural areas may become a problem because of changing climate. As the population rises, as there are literally more people, there will be more houses, more roads, more schools, and everything, and that means that uh, there's less land to farm on, so we need to produce more from less land, and you can see just in the last uh, 90 years or so going up to 2050, what that looks like per person. And then finally, uh, changing economies. And, and what I mean by that is, if you think about some of the most populated parts of the world, uh, the economies are growing in some of those parts of the world. And as economies grow and more and more people um, get into the middle class, the preferences for diets start to shift. And a lot of that shifts toward more protein. And some of that, sometimes that means more, more meat. Uh, and that puts even more pressure on agricultural production because a lot of that will come from the grains and, and so on. So there are a lot of pressures uh, for us to find ways to produce more, and this is one of the reasons why I keep coming to work every day, and this is what really drives me. So with all those challenges um, that farmers face when it comes to producing food, fuel, and fiber, um, I don't know about you, but I know that I, you know, tend to feel a little bit overwhelmed. But fear not, because technology will allow us to create more efficient systems and, and produce food, fuel, and fiber for a growing population using our resources most efficiently. So in the one corner, you can see biotechnology at work. Um, there are some dead weeds uh, that were not resistant to glyphosate, and you see the desired crop in this case. Um, here, let me try and find my point. Uh, in this picture right here, you see the soybeans that are resistant thriving. Over here, you see the application of data science and data analytics, um, platforms that help farmers understand, you know, when to apply nitrogen at, and at what rate um, and where and what soil types do they have, what's the moisture of their soils. 
um, things like drones that can be used for imaging and reduce the passes on the on a field, and just good agronomic practices on um, on the farm, like cover crops and crop rotation. Okay, so um, I don't know how many of you have come from an agricultural background, maybe grew up on a farm, maybe have a farm. Uh, many of you probably garden at home, and so you know that there are a lot of decisions that have to be made. So when you think about a farmer, um, they need to make hundreds of decisions, maybe 40 key decisions on what to plant, when to plant, what what kinds of fertilizer, if any, um, how far apart to plant things, and so on. There's many, many decisions that have to be made, and a lot of pressures on for on farmers to find solutions to things like let me get the pointer here insect control being able to control insects okay of course farms are out there in the open and there are insects everywhere if you're a gardener you know that weed control plant health keeping your plants healthy away from diseases so it's it's um, there's a lot of pressure out there from those in addition to that because it's a business, they also want as much yield as possible, and a lot of that is related to the fertility of their plants. So these are just some of the pressures that farmers are under. Now, today we're going to talk about biotechnology or GMOs, but that's just one of many possible solutions that you can bring to bear on this. So there's the biotechnology part, but more and more, there's an involvement of data science and being able to understand the data that's going on farms and how to use those data to make better insights, to better to to make better decisions. Plant breeding, of course, Lisa talked about that a little, and she's going to talk about it some more. Biologicals is a new area that us, we, and, and many others are getting interested in. And if you think about, uh, for example, probiotics for for people, that's um, there's a lot of interest in that lately. Uh, you can think about that in the same way for plants. So plants have bacteria that grow in them, on them, and around them, in the soil especially. And many of those um, actually help the plants in being able to better understand how that works. So, so these are just some of the ways that we and others are approaching this. We're going to focus on biotechnology and GMOs today, but it's, uh, there's a lot of other ways to, to address these problems. Larry, so this brings us right into some of the methods of crop modification. Now, as Larry said, you know, there are a couple of different terms when it comes to GMO, and they're all a bit uh, interchangeable, so it can be kind of confusing, but biotechnology, DNA recombinants, genetic engineering, GMOs. But what does it mean to genetically modify an organism? Well, as it turns out, that acronym is not very specific. So Lisa is going to tell us a little bit more about each of these different modification techniques. Thanks, Val. Um, OK, so I'm going to go through the first few um, examples of different modification techniques. And these are all the ones that I'm going to talk about are all techniques that have been used for several decades, if not centuries, um, by people um, to breed crops that they are interested in or to select crops that, that they want to eat. So the first one, um, crossbreeding, you might also just hear people call this just breeding. Um, and this is just when uh, somebody would take, you know, plant A and plant B. Um, maybe they have the same type of traits and then maybe they are different. You know, one might be a little bit bigger than the other and then they'll cross these two plants together. They'll grow all of the offspring, and then they'll select the offspring that has the characteristics that they want. So in the example that's shown in this picture with wheat, you have a tall wheat that has a lot of um, grain on it, and you have a shorter wheat. Here, I can use my pointer. Uh, you have a shorter wheat here that has less grain. Well, wouldn't it be nice you know, if you could combine those, so maybe you want a short wheat plant that has a lot of grain. And so you can achieve this through crossbreeding. And uh, here's just some interesting examples that uh, I really like. Um, and these are both results of just traditional crossbreeding, um, also called conventional breeding. Um, 
One good example is corn. Um, so this is the corn that we're familiar with eating today. But when people first started growing this and using it as a crop, um, it looked a lot more like this. This is the wild ancestor of corn called teosinte. It had really small, hard kernels. Um, and just over time, from the process of selection, um, we have gotten to what we now know as corn. Um, another really interesting example, when I first learned about this, I was amazed. Um, but all of these different foods that I'm sure most of you have eaten, at least some of these, um, kale, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, these are all actually the same species of plant. Um, they've just been bred to have different varieties um, with different you know, flavors or textures, characteristics. Um, so I always think that that's pretty interesting. Okay, a second example um, of how people have manipulated um, our food in uh, what's considered a conventional breeding way is mutagenesis. Um, and when I say mutagenesis, uh, what I am referring to is like kind of a non-specific, broad um, alteration of DNA in a plant. Um, this is really commonly used in fruit and also in um, like non-food crops, I guess you could call them crops, like our ornamental plants that we grow in our garden, like flowers and trees are sometimes bred um, using different types of mutagenesis. One example is a grapefruit, so different, different varieties of um, grapefruit and some other citrus fruits um, came about because of Somebody took one variety and exposed it to either like chemicals or radiation um, and then got a different variety out of that, which they selected for. And so this is kind of used as a way to basically um, speed up maybe the natural variation um, that you would get through crossbreeding. So you're not introducing anything with mutagenesis that wouldn't necessarily happen on its own in nature. You're just maybe kind of pushing it to happen a little bit quicker. Um, another thing that I think is pretty interesting about plants um, is that they can have a variety of different ploides. So humans are diploid. A lot of animals are diploid, meaning we have two sets of chromosomes, one from our mom, one from our dad. Um, a lot of plants are actually polyploids. Um, some of those occur naturally as polyploids, and some of them people have um, done specific crosses to make them polyploids. And all polyploidy means is that there's more than one set of chromosomes. Um, so instead of maybe getting one from your mom and one from your dad, like this example in watermelon here, maybe you get two from your mom. Your mom has two sets of chromosomes, your dad has four, and so then maybe the offspring sometimes would end up with you know, a combination of that, in this case three. Um, and so watermelons and also the seedless watermelons and also bananas um, are really good examples of uh, foods that we eat that have three sets of chromosomes. Um, and this makes them sterile, actually. So that's why you get seedless watermelon. Um, usually when there's an odd number of chromosomes, they don't pair correctly. And so the offspring is sterile. OK, Larry's okay. going to talk to you now more about Transgenics, yes. So uh, Lisa's done a good job of talking about other ways that crops and foods that come from those crops have been genetically modified. Um, and and uh, it's true that those are forms of GMOs. However, we know that when most people think about GMOs, when they talk about GMOs, when they're asking questions about GMOs, they're talking about what we call transgenics. So we'll spend some time talking about that. Um, so in this method of modification, what we're doing is we're taking a gene or more or more than one gene, but usually just a few from one organism and transferring it into another one. That's where the word trans comes from. It comes from one organism into another. And, and typically, this is from a bacterial gene. This is a bacterial gene from a bacterium that is transferred into a plant. 
And so when this is happening, as I said, it's one, let me get my pointer going here, one or more genes that are transferred in the plant, typically from a bacterium. And an example of that that um, not a lot of people are aware of is, is papaya, so specifically rainbow papaya, which is a type of papaya that's grown in many places of the world, but especially in Hawaii. And so there was a, a problem with the uh, papaya growing in Hawaii in that it was being attacked by a disease called papaya ring spot virus. So all plants are susceptible to diseases, and rainbow papaya in Hawaii was being attacked by papaya ring spot virus, and it was spreading so vastly that it threatened to wipe out the entire industry in Hawaii. So scientists uh, at Cornell University, other universities, in conjunction with papaya growers in Hawaii, came together to try a transgenic approach, a GMO approach, in which they cloned a bit of the virus, the very same virus that is attacking it, cloned a bit of the very same virus into the papaya, and this makes the papaya now resistant to that virus. And this was done a long time ago, many years ago, and it's still uh, widely grown in Hawaii and is really responsible for saving that industry in Hawaii. So when we talk about GMOs, usually we mean this type of genetic modification, which we also call transgenics. And we'll come back and talk about that some more in a little bit and how we make them and so on. But now we'll go to the next slide and talk about a sixth method of modification that you may have heard of called gene editing. This is new and there are no commercial products uh, in the supply chain in the commercial, so you can't go to the grocery store, for example, and buy foods that have been produced by gene editing yet. But this is a fast-growing method that's being used by universities, companies all over the world, and it's really exciting. It's got me excited because of the possibilities for what you can do. So let's talk a little bit about how it differs from what I just talked about in the last slide, transgenics, also known as GMOs. In gene editing, we're using techniques that will make precise deletions in the DNA, so this is a strand of DNA, and a, a precise change, typically a deletion, in the DNA of the plant's own gene is typically what's being done in gene editing. So one big difference compared to GMOs is we're not adding a whole gene or more than one gene, for example, from a bacterium. And another difference is the changes tend to be pretty small. And everything that's being worked on right now is typically a small deletion. In this example here, it's not actually a plant, it's a fungus, it's a mushroom. Um, and what the, the scientists did in this case was they made a precise deletion that made it so that when you start cutting the mushroom up, getting ready to cook it or eat it, uh, it doesn't turn brown. Everybody has seen that, that their mushrooms will turn brown quickly after you cut them. And so in this variety of mushroom, that gene that causes that to happen has been knocked out. And you can imagine doing this in other plants, uh, apples, potatoes, avocado. Everybody would love to have avocado that doesn't brown. And so this is a really exciting technology. Uh, if you haven't heard of gene editing, you've probably heard of CRISPR. CRISPR is the actual uh, molecular technique that is used to do the gene editing. And there's a lot of excitement and interest in this technology because of what it can do, not just for agriculture and food, but for human health. So uh, we're all watching this with interest. Um, as I said, that you, you can't find products with this yet, but there's a lot of interest in this area and a lot of work happening. And a lot of crops, a lot of foods. Okay, so let's go back. Oh, sorry, I think we have a, a pause for questions here. Thank you, Larry. Uh, so far I haven't seen any questions in the chat window. Uh, we can give them a few seconds, and then uh, if they don't have any questions now, they can put them in when they think of it, and we'll address them at our next Q&A. I see a question, so uh, I'm not sure who's going to address it, but here's the question. It says, this is from Christine, 
I was surprised to find out this presentation would be by Monsanto. I realize they do extensive research into GMOs, but they also are responsible for many other things that uh, generally ruin the public's opinion of GMOs. What do you say to those who believe GMOs are inherently harmful due to Monsanto's horrendous business practices? Well, this is Larry, and I can uh, start to address that question, although we will talk a little bit more as we talk about uh, the pipeline for GMOs, and that's a good time to talk about patents. Um, I'll, I'll just quickly say right now that um, patents have been around for a long time in plants, in foods, long before GMOs, long before Monsanto was, was making GMOs. Um, but maybe we can come back to that when we um, when we talk about the pipeline for making GMOs because that'll um, be an opportunity to talk about how long it takes and how uh, how expensive it is to do it and a big part of that is also the safety testing. So um, not trying to defer the question, I'm just saying um, let's let's come back to that later. Thank you, Larry. Another question uh, from Rashmi, he wants to know how GMO differs from organic. Okay, this is Larry. I'll try to take that one too. So in most, I think all, if not uh, most uh, organic certification methods um, of growing uh, do not allow genetically modified uh, organisms in the sense that I talked about them a couple of slides ago, the transgenics. So organics do not allow those. Um, I, I, I think I'll point out that um, that doesn't mean that organic um, farming doesn't use technology, of course, and it also doesn't mean that they don't use pesticides um, because they do. They're just not synthetic. They're natural pesticides. And one example of that is um, the use of BTs, BT, Bacillus thuringiensis, as an insect protection uh, pesticide. So this is a bacterium that naturally produces pesticides uh, against a wide range of insects, and they are allowed to be used in organic farming. And when we come back uh, a little bit later, we'll talk about BT crops and how, uh, in a transgenic way, you can take those genes, those same genes that were in the bacterium, and put them into crops to protect the crops in a different way. Thank you, Larry. I'll keep monitoring the chat window for additional questions, but feel free to continue with the presentation. Okay, so this is me again. So this is the exact same slide we showed about three slides back, transgenics. Um, and so we're going to spend a little bit of time in a couple of slides talking about how they're actually made. How do you actually go about making a GMO, a transgenic plant? Again, this is what I spent almost all my career doing. So this, this figure shows ba a basic um, pathway for how we make GMOs. And there's two basic parts at the beginning. First, what you're going to transfer the genes into. We call that the explant. And then how you're going to transfer the genes into that explant. And there's two different methods here. So what we transfer it into could be any part of the plant could be a part of the leaf, could be a part of the root, but very typically what we transfer the genes into is an embryo that's growing inside the seed of the plant. So this is the baby plant that's growing, for example, inside the kernel of the, the corn. If you've eaten sweet corn, which I'm sure you all have, sometimes as you're eating it, you'll see these little, little things that pop out of the kernels as you're eating them, or if you just take a kernel off and squeeze it, a little embryo will pop out of there. And that's what we're going to be uh, transferring our genes into, we're, we're transferring the genes into the cells that are on the embryo. So there's, there's two ways that we have transferred genes into embryos. And first I'll talk about this particle bombardment method. So many of you have maybe heard about something called a gene gun or a particle bombardment. Um, it's not a real gun, uh, but it uses the same kind of principle where what, what we do is we take the gene or the genes that we want to transfer into the plant we coat them onto very, very small, almost microscopic metal particles, like gold, typically gold, and then put that into something that is like a gun. It's going to, part, it's going to accelerate those particles 
basically shoot them down a tube, and at the end of that tube is a petri plate that has plant cells in it, specifically embryos. And when that happens, those little metal particles are going to collide with those cells. They're going to actually pierce those cells, and that's how it's going to deliver the genes into the cell. And then those genes are going to diffuse off of the particles. They're going to make their way into the nucleus. They're going to make their way into the chromosome, and they will insert into the chromosome, one of the chromosomes, and now uh, you have just added one more gene to the 30 or 40,000 genes that were already there. That's one method, and that's how some of the first products that we and others made were, uh, were made, with this particle gun method. More recently, especially in the last 15 years or so, we've shifted to another method using a bacterium called agrobacterium. So, oops, I keep hitting the wrong button with that. Okay, so it, it, this is a picture of a crown gall. So a crown gall is a disease that's caused by agrobacterium. If you've been, ever been wa walking in a forest or something, uh, or, you know, around the neighborhood maybe, uh, sometimes you'll see a tree that has this big thing growing out of it, this big blob growing out of it, and that is usually caused by agrobacterium. And, and there are a lot of bacteria that cause a lot of diseases in plants, but what makes agrobacterium so special is that it causes the disease by transferring genes into the plant cells, and then those genes make those cells divide uh, like that, and this is actually to provide basically a home for the bacterium to live in and produces sugars that the plants, that the, um, that the bacterium likes. Okay, so that's how agrobacterium works in nature. Of course, we're not trying to cause disease, we're trying to transfer useful genes to provide useful traits in the plants. And so scientists and Monsanto and many other places figured out 25, maybe even 30 years ago, that you could take those genes that cause the disease and replace them with any gene you want. Now, when you mix those agrobacterium cells with, the, with, with those explants, those embryos, now it'll transfer those genes into the plant cell, into the plant nucleus, and it'll become part of a chromosome. All of that happens in like a day, a day or two, but then the process continues for several weeks. And one reason why it takes so long is because first you have to find those rare cells that have been transformed, and we do that by turning the embryo cells into a different type of cell called a callus. So the cells are just dividing and dividing, and we're doing this under conditions where only the cells that have been transformed, that have taken up a gene, will be able to divide. And this will go on for a few weeks. You can't see in the picture. I, actually, I think there's a picture coming up in a minute. Um, I'll show you better. Uh, then, after a while, we want to regenerate those. That means we take those callus uh, cells and turn them back into plants. And we do that by adding natural plant hormones. So plants, just like people, have hormones. And just like with people, adding different kinds of hormones will produce different kinds of results. So there is a set of hormones that will make the plant cells start to form roots and a set of hormones that will make the plant cells start to form shoots. And over a course of adding these different hormones, over the course of a few weeks, you'll generate a normal-looking plant, which will then form a uh, normal seed. I think we might have some pictures on this slide, so uh, it's going to be a little hard to see, but on this petri plate, um, really hard to see, but there's little specks on there, and those little specks are little individual embryos. That's what we add the agrobacterium to. After a few weeks, uh, those embryos will start to form callus, which is just a, a, a group of cells. They're not green. They don't have leaves. They don't have roots, but they, those are living cells that are growing. And then we start adding our hormones first to start to form roots, and then later on to start forming shoots. And then finally, you'll get a plant back that has roots and shoots. All of this is happening in these petri plates because in these early stages especially, these plants aren't doing photosynthesis, these plant cells. So we have to actually provide the nutrients for them because they can't provide them themselves. In the end, we end up with a plant that has normal roots, normal shoots. Since all the cells of that plant came from one cell uh, that was infected by agrobacterium at the beginning, 
what's uh, all of the cells will have those genes and the seeds will have those genes as well. Um, this is how this is how we make the um, what I just got them talk, tell, talking about was how we make the transgenic plants, the GMOs, in in various crops. Um, you might be surprised to know that this actually happens in nature. As I mentioned, Agrobacterium is, normally infects plants and transfers its own gene, and we see that lots of examples of that in nature. But an interesting one is that recently, sweet potatoes, which most of us have eaten, um, when sweet potatoes were sequenced, when scientists determined the sequence of sweet potatoes, they found these agrobacterium genes in sweet potatoes. And, and so what this means was several thousand years ago, about 8,000 years ago, they think, the sweet potato was actually uh, infected by agrobacterium. So it's sort of a natural GMO. And it is what makes sweet potatoes sweet. And so in a, in a way, it's what makes sweet potatoes the way that we want them. And so I, we thought that was a really interesting example of a, a natural form of what I just got done talking about. So we have a polling question up there for the participants. Uh, I have uh, letter choices A through D for you uh, below your name. So if you'd like to participate, please choose A, B, C, or D, depending on what you think is the correct answer for how many GMO crops are commercially available. I'll give you a few seconds to record your responses. If you're not sure where that uh, polling button is, it's right below your name, um, the fourth icon over. And if you uh, can't find it, you can go ahead and put A, B, C, or D in the uh, chat window as well. And I think I'm going to go ahead and lock the poll. And I'll make those responses visible. There we go. All right, thanks. Um, yeah, this is um, kind of, I guess, about what I've expected um, from conversations that I've had with various people about uh, commercially available GMOs. So the correct answer is 10. Um, currently on the market, there are only 10 crops that you can buy GMO varieties of. Um, okay, so this uh, slide you can see here, um, eight of those ten, um, the two that are not depicted in this graphic are apples. There's a couple varieties of apples that are now available, um, and potatoes. And the apples and potatoes are both varieties that were um, developed to not bruise or brown as quickly um, when they're cut into. Um, and here's just a few examples on the right side over here um, of what types of um, traits have been put into these various crops. So there are, um, are some that probably people are more familiar with than others. So I'm going to try to highlight some of the things maybe you're less familiar with. Um, for example, there's corn that has increased drought tolerance. Um, different types of disease resistance and insect resistance. Um, the papaya that Larry mentioned earlier um, that is resistant to a virus. Um, and then cotton um, has probably the widest used GMO in cotton as a pesticide resistance. Um, and we've been uh, researching and growing some of these for, you know, 18 years. Um, in this country. And different, um, these are all just specific to the United States. Um, so there are different crops that are, that have been genetically modified um, that are available in different countries. Um, it varies country to country what you can find. So here are some examples um, of 
crops that are not GMO. Um, maybe maybe you thought might have been. Um, so currently on the market, Honeycrisp apples are not. Um, like I mentioned earlier, there are a couple varieties of apples that are, but Honeycrisp apples are not. Seedless watermelon I mentioned earlier, um, that is just from crossbreeding, two lines that have different ploides. Um, there's no GMOs involved in that. No, no um, tomatoes are. Um, there's no wheat on the market that is GMO. Um, and then broccoli and carrots, just a few examples of things that are not a GMO. Um, so here's another little uh, polling question. So if you've ever like Googled GMOs, I'm sure a lot of different pictures have come up, um, some of them scarier than others. Um, so if, you, if you'd like to use your polling abil like voting abilities and vote on which one of these um, is the correct statement. Thank you, Lisa. So uh, again, use the letter A, B, C, or D uh, in the polling tab and uh, record which one of those statements uh, are correct. It looks like a lot of people are choosing D. I wonder if that's the correct one, Lisa. Uh, yeah, Is, are, are we done with it? Yeah. Do you want to close it? Yeah, so most people there chose There you go, I published the results. Um, most people chose D, and that is the correct um, answer. So I mentioned in the previous slide that there are no tomatoes that are currently on the market that are um, GMO. Uh, we, as Larry, you know, just walked you through the process of how we make GMOs. You could see that syringes were not involved in that process at all, even though oftentimes we see it depicted that way on the internet. Um, and just in general, when you're working in a scientific lab, um, and sometimes in the field, you know, you wear PPE. It's just good practice. Um, it keeps your samples safe and it keeps you safe. So. All right, back to me. Um, so we've been talking about GMOs, and when you think about GMOs and hear about GMOs, you often hear about them in the context of crops and maybe food. Uh, but of course, I think we all know that GMOs are used outside of ag and crops in many useful ways that all of us can appreciate, like the, the picture in the center there. But you know, with regard to medicine, a lot of medicines, including insulin, are produced through genetically modified organisms, usually bacteria in this case. And, and so when you think about biotechnology and its, its applications, medicine is absolutely a great place to apply biotechnology approaches, including genetically modified organisms. Uh, yeasts, uh, some of the yeasts that are used to, to um, bake bread or brew beer have been genetically modified. I actually worked on yeast in graduate school not to brew, be brew beer or make bread, but, but it made a lot of genetically modified yeast for basic research. And then enzymes, and so enzymes, what I mean by this is enzymes that are used in things like cheese production. And so uh, renin is produced through biotechnology, GMO yeast, typically. And if you think about it, you know, there are other ways to do these things without GMOs, without biotechnology, but, you know, maybe not so great. So insulin, for example, before biotechnology approaches to producing insulin would be, would be isolated from pancreas. And it would be expensive, and, 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 and a lot of animals would be sacrificed for that. Same thing with the, the renin and the enzymes to produce uh, renin for cheese. Um, these would be isolated from, I, I think, the fourth gut of cows or something like that, but still very expensive and um, very disruptive. And so GMOs can be used to produce a lot of these same things that in the past were difficult to do in, in a biotechnology way. So this is the slide, uh, one of the slides that I was referring to earlier that I said I would get to. And so this describes the process of producing GMOs in the way that we do it and, and a lot of the commercial entities do it. And if you're familiar with how medicines are 
created, discovered, and then advanced through the pipeline. It looks a lot like that. Um, in fact, I think Val at the very beginning talked about how we, we of course, uh, interact with uh, investors a lot, and they, they always want to know where are we in the, the development of products. And so we came up with this way of describing the advancement of our products in these phases, just like in clinical trials, for example, in medicine. So there's a lot of information on this slide. I'm not going to go through all of it. Uh, you can look at it later if you're interested in some of these details, but just a couple of main points that I want to make is, first, it takes a long time. It takes a, about an average of 13 years to produce a GMO crop. By produce, I mean going from discovery all the way to the actual product launch. It also costs a lot of money. And so um, the average, I think, is about 136 million dollars to produce this. And a big part of that is in these later phases where a lot of the safety testing is being done. We'll talk a little bit more about that, I think, on the next slide. So GMO crops are regulated everywhere in the world. And what that means is that safety studies have to be done and submitted to regulatory agencies around the world. So a huge part of the product development and a huge part of the cost uh, involves that. Even though it looks like we're doing safety studies here only in this one phase, it's, it continues and it even starts at the very beginning when, when uh, my fellow scientists and I are just starting to try to think of a product or a product concept, we're taking safety into, consider, into consideration right at the beginning in, in the form of, for example, is the gene that we're going to work with, does it have the the characteristics of known allergens. Obviously, we're going to test later to know if it really is, but we won't even start with things, for example, that, that have some of the characteristics of, of known allergens. So a lot of money, a long time. That's the take home from this slide. And, and by the way, this also gets to the question of patenting, although I did point out that um, patents have been around a long time before GMOs and before Monsanto was patenting GMOs. Um, um, the, it, the, the reason why patents are there is because of the investment that it takes to put in this, and that's not unique to GMOs. Um, plant breeders have been doing that for, for decades. So this slide uh, makes some of the same points, going from product concept all the way to market, um, and just talks a little bit more about some of the things that are happening in there. Uh, we're making our choice of our genes um, at the beginning, and we're going to our product post-market assessment at the end, but it all starts with a product concept. And people often ask us, where do you get the ideas for the, the products that you make? And we're working primarily with farmers and growers around the world, and so we're asking what they need, and they're telling us what they need. And so a lot of their needs are, as we talked about earlier, uh, insect control, being able to control insects, being able to control weeds, and, of course, uh, more yield and plant health go through our gene discovery, make our plants, select our plants, de develop the varieties. That means take those genes from the plant that they were put into and put them into other varieties. The regulatory process, again, it looks like it's happening at one place, but it's actually happening throughout this. It's being considered throughout this. Now, we'll just talk about a few of the, the Monsanto GMO traits. Many of these you've probably heard about. I already mentioned BT products. I'll talk about a couple of these other ones, too. So BT crops. Um, BT stands for Bacillus thuringiensis. This is a bacterium. It grows naturally in the soil and around plants. This is the one that I was referring to a little while ago when I said that it's actually used and has been used for decades in organic farming. Uh, for, for, for whatever reason, Bt produces naturally proteins that are toxic to insects. And some of those can be very specific. They can be specific to a class of insects or they can be uh, specific to a species of insect. So these toxins uh, that are produced in the bacterium, when an insect eats that bacterium, for example, if that bacterium is growing on the plant and the insect eats it, it's going to ingest those proteins, these, these toxins are all proteins, and then it's going to have an effect in the insect. And as I said, this can be very specific. And one of the reasons why it's very specific 
is because that protein, when it's in the insect gut and it's in the insect stomach, is going to interact with specific receptors. These are proteins that are on the surface of the insect cell, and it's like having a lock and a key. The, the key only works in certain locks, so certain toxin proteins only work with certain receptors in certain insects. That's really one of the main reasons why they, they can be so specific and are so specific. There are other reasons. So um, these proteins first have to be digested in the insect gut, and that only happens in certain pH environments. And so it wouldn't happen, for example, in, in our guts. Um, and so th these over here are some of the larvae. So these are the, the larvae that are actually doing the damage, actually eating the plant. You can see what that actually looks like. So a, a, a set of corn roots that have been basically eaten down to almost nothing by an insect called corn rootworm, whereas a, a healthy plant that has been protected with one or more BT genes has little to no insect damage to its roots. This is an insect called corn borer. It actually bores through corn. That's why it's called corn borer. And this is going to affect the health of the plant. And if it bores enough through the, the stalk of the corn, it'll actually make the plant tip over. Uh, so that was insect resistance, and that was just an example of corn. But there um, are lots of other insect resistance examples. Um, but the next class is um, plants that have been engineered to be resistant to an herbicide called Roundup, also known as glyphosate. So glyphosate is the active ingredient. And so glyphosate and Roundup, also known as Roundup, are a broad range, broad spectrum herbicides that were discovered many years ago. Um, and they will have an effect on a wide range of plants. Pretty much all plants will, are susceptible to Roundup. Farmers need to control weeds. They absolutely need to control weeds, just like they need to co control insects. The more weeds they have in the field, the less healthy their plants are. They're competing for resources, and they, um, their, their yield will be lower. Um, once the plants start growing, the crops start growing, it's very challenging for farmers to control weeds. And so this type of GMO was created to provide a solution for farmers to be able to control weeds after their own crops have started growing. Um, the Roundup herbicide glyphosate affects plants by interfering with a specific enzyme that all plants have called EPSPS. It's an enzyme that's, that's necessary to produce amino acids that the plants, all plants need. That's the step that, that the enzyme, that the step that the enzyme catalyzes is blocked by Roundup. There are forms of this enzyme that are resistant, naturally resistant to this, uh, this uh, herbicide. And so one of these came from a bacterium called agrobacterium, the very same one that I, I told you about before. And if you take that gene and put it into plants, that very same enzyme can still catalyze the same enzymatic reactions the plant gene did, but is no longer affected by Roundup. And so now the, the plant is now resistant to Roundup. And so when a farmer has weeds in the field, they can now spray Roundup on their field, and it will control the weeds, but it won't affect the plants. This has been um, a huge plus for farmers and it's been widely adopted. I think over 90% of soybean acres now are planted with Roundup, uh, Roundup Ready soybean, and uh, other crops have used this gene as well. So we're talking about GMOs, and these last two examples I just gave you are examples of GMOs, specifically GMOs that we've worked on. Uh, but in the case of Roundup Ready, um, there's the GMO part, which is what we're talking about today, but what it enables is the farmer to be able to use Roundup post-emergent after the, the plants have come up to control weeds. And so I do want to say just a couple of words about the safety of glyphosate. So one thing I want to talk about first about with, with any time you talk about toxicity, it's, it's really important to make the point that toxicity is related to dose. Pretty much anything can be toxic at some dose. Water is toxic at a high dose. Um, I'm getting some comments that my mic sounds strange. I'll just 
keep going because I don't know that there's anything I can do from my end. Anyway, so um, toxicity is related to dose. Almost anything can be toxic at, at the high enough dose. And so um, whenever anybody asks or talks about toxicity, it's always important to keep in mind dose. And one of, the, one of the advantages of Roundup is that it can have an effect at very low dose. And so, for example, uh, people, people imagine um, that fields are being drenched in glyphosate. The amount of glyphosate being used on a large farm is tiny. Um, it's, it's like less than a soda can. Depends on the size of the farm, of course. Um, so it's a very low dose. It's gone through uh, hundreds of safety studies, been registered uh, for more than 100, in more than 160 countries, got a long history, it's been extremely well studied. And so along with the GMOs and all of the study that has to go into the assessing the safety of that, the same thing happens uh, for the chemicals as well, including glyphosate. Okay, going back to Val. So um, with that being said, um, people are curious about um, some of these technologies. And we were receiving several requests from educators like yourself saying, hey, how can we get access to transgenic seeds and conventional seeds because we want to grow them in our classroom, um, have these conversations, and you know, potentially spray them with glyphosate and phenotypically see what happens. Um, and to be honest with you, we were, our process was really quite slow. It was taking us upwards of three months to um, get it processed internally so that we could then send it to folks. And then once we did, uh, unfortunately, they had to sign like, you know, a 10-page material transfer form. It just wasn't ideal at all. And really, um, many of us who are very passionate about this subject uh, have said, hey, you know, we need to have a better process for this because we want people to interact with this technology, ask better questions, and really see it for themselves. So we were able to develop a new tool with um, agriculture in the classroom. Um, and if you go to that website right there, you can actually go on there and order a um, Roundup Ready soybean kit. And it comes with um, Roundup Ready or, you know, glyphosate resistant seeds and also conventional seeds. Um, it also comes with lateral flow strips so that you can either crush up the seed or grow the seed and do a leaf uh, tissue sample to see if that CP4 gene is present, um, as well as uh, a series of curriculum that goes with it. So the curriculum is on the agriculture, excuse me, agriculture in the classroom matrix. Um, and you should be able to find all that information at this link here. One of the activities is to show competition um, from the desired crop that you, you want to grow and the wheat. So this is a pretty um, extreme version of high, high weed pressure, but you can see that that jackgrass and other weeds are outcompeting the soybeans. And if, if you can believe it, there are actually soybeans um, tucked under some of those leaves there. Uh, and then another part of the activity is to then um, spray the, the plants with, with glyphosate. And uh, you can see that these conventional soybeans um, were affected. Um, however, the um, herbicide tolerant soybeans were not affected. Um, so this allows you to have this conversation in the classroom with your students um, to where you can talk about biotechnology. Um, your students can actually run some of these experiments. Um, you can have the conversation with them about, you know, how do farmers manage their weeds? What does a technology like glyphosate allow a farmer to do, such as um, adopt practices like no-till or minimum tillage? Um, and really just, you know, be able to interact with, with this technology. So we're going to pause, uh, pause here um, for two more questions. and. I believe that Lisa actually has to, to leave, so um, if she's still on the line, um, we'll want to make sure that, that you guys can ask your, your one of the two questions to her, but if not, Larry and I are here. So. 
Thank you, Valerie. I think that she has left us. Uh, I was keeping track of some of the questions, and the most two recent questions were uh, this. Um, Christine asked, does glyphosate bioaccumulate? Uh, Larry, if you're answering that, turn on your mic. Okay, it is on. No, I, I wasn't answering it. I was just going to ask, though, could you repeat the question? Sorry. Glyphosate, what? Yes, gly uh, glyphosate, is it, does it bioaccumulate? Oh, does it bioaccumulate? Um, so uh, it does, it, it, glyphosate, one of the other advantages of glyphosate is it has a relatively short half-life. I think that was on the slide. Um, and so, it's um, and it's um, it's half life is shorter than most other herbicides. So, for example, in the soil or on the plant, it's quickly degraded and uh, metabolizes what we say by uh, soil bacteria to convert it into uh, other compounds. Thank you, Larry. Um, Kitty asks: Is Bt toxic to all Coleoptera and Lepidoptera, or one specific one? Yeah, I'll take that one too. Um, not, there are some BTs that have wide spectrum, and then there are some that are very specific. And we use the most specific ones we can find. So yes, there are some BTs that um, are pretty broad range. Um, but one of the very first things we do when we start working with our BTs, and I led a team in Cambridge, Massachusetts that did this for a few years, is tested against a whole panel of insects, including, say, for example, a whole panel of coleopterans or a whole panel of lepidopterans, uh, monarch butterfly, honeybees, earthworms, things like that. Uh, they'll be tested against all of that, but more specifically to the, the question asked, um, the Bt proteins that we work with are specific to specific species of coleopterans or um, uh, lepidopterans or any insect that we work on. Thank you, Larry. And just as a follow-up on the glyphosate, uh, Jenny asks, um, if it has such a short half-life, why is glyphosate residue found on supermarket produce? So, Val, were you going to answer that, or I can take a crack at it? Yeah, go ahead. I think that um, this goes back to, you know, the old toxicology saying the dose makes the poison. So it's going to depend on, um, you know, parts per million, parts per billion residue. But go ahead, Larry. Yeah. Um, and so, so I'm not an expert in this area. I'm a, a molecular biologist, but but I I, I do think that. Um, one has to be careful at looking at, at some reports. So when, when some of these um, uh, reports of glyphosate or any compound for that matter being detected at levels that are in the parts per billion or parts per, you know, very, very, very small uh, levels, uh, when, when, um, when compounds are being uh, supposedly detected at those levels, you're now working in a range that is extremely difficult to be confident of of finding that. So, so I know that that that's uh, that can be disputed, but I do think that um, when residues are found at ex reported to be found at extremely low levels, then you'd have to really look at the uh, analytics that were done to actually find it to find out how valid it actually is. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Gilbertson, I think uh, in the, uh, for time we're going to go ahead and go on, and uh, there'll be times for uh, questions and answers at the end of the program as well. Okay, well, we <laughs> kind of just talking about this, so we're running out of time, so I'll just go over this quickly. Um, you know, I, I'm a Monsanto scientist, uh, but I, I really do believe that there are huge environmental benefits. Uh, from some of the things that we've been talking about, including the reduction of pesticides. So, for example, the Bt crops, um, and especially in some crops like cotton. So, cotton, because it's not widely eaten, um, some of the regulations for uh, the amount of pesticide that's allowed to be used is, is quite high. And so, in those cases, using a transgenic approach really reduces the pesticide use. 
um, uh, CO2 emissions uh, are reduced by, for example, using Roundup Ready crops that don't require a farmer to go in and till the land before they plant. So normally farmers would try to control weeds by tilling the land, which releases a lot of CO2 to the environment. In addition to just making the plants, the crops in the field more manageable and not having to drive through the fields back and forth spraying pesticides, for example. And then the biggest one, I think, is just the protecting the yield or increasing the yield. And so what this literally means is you can produce more food from less land. And, and I, I've seen some amazing pictures of how much land would be required to produce the amount of corn as it was hap as it was yielding back in like the 1920s and 1930s, and um, the difference is amazing. So so the more we can produce from an acre using not just GMOs but all of the technologies we've been talking about uh, in the earlier part of this, uh, that's just less land that has to be put into agriculture to feed those 9.5 billion people, and that alone is going to do a lot to keep the level of diversity where it is now instead of reducing it. Um, and again, because we're starting to run out of time, i just mentioned some other products. We've talked about uh, some of the Monsanto products, but there's a lot of GMO work going on in other places. It says other industry, but not all of these are industry. In fact, most of them aren't. Many of you have probably heard about golden rice. This is rice that has been engineered to produce a beta carotene, which is a precursor to vitamin A. And this is, has a potential to have huge, huge um, impact on parts of the world where vitamin A defici deficiency is a major problem. I don't know if anybody's on the phone from, from Florida, but citrus greening is really threatening the orange industry down there. Um, resistant wheat, so aphids spread diseases, and if we can make them resistant to that, that would be great. Potato, there's um, varieties of potato that have been engineered to not turn brown or not or resist bruising. There's a lot of interest lately in genetically engineered mosquitoes um, for trying to protect the, uh, basically engineering the mosquitoes so that the mosquito population either decreases, so you have less malaria spread, or makes it so that they can't spread malaria. And especially with uh, outbreaks of Zika, there's a lot of interest in this. And in some grocery stores, you can now find these Arctic apples. They're not widely available yet, but they're out there. And they've been engineered to make it so that they don't turn brown after you cut them, which is one thing that makes kids often not want to finish their apples. So these are all uh, some really interesting and potentially impactful areas that we're not working on, uh, but a lot of other people are. So uh, we wanted to take a second and um, connect you all to some uh, cool kind of third-party resources that we've come across uh, as it relates to talking about modern agriculture and uh, the sophistication of modern agriculture for teachers. Um, I'm not sure about you all, but I really love podcasts, and so we have a couple of listed here. Um, this Talking Biotech podcast talks a lot about plant breeding, but also the application of biotechnology in agriculture. Um, Science Versus is a podcast that sort of debunks um, pseudoscientific claims uh, and looks into things like, you know, is consuming sugar bad for you, or do supplements work, or things like that. Owl, Owl Pellets um, is more of an ad-based podcast. Um, that goes through kind of, you know, how do you start a greenhouse and maintain a garden, and what are some classroom management practices for having multiple preps. Um, and then we have a couple of examples of uh, what I would consider really exceptional teacher professional development opportunities. Um, BioBuilder is one that explores synthetic biology. Um, the, the person who started BioBuilder, her name is Natalie Kudwell out of uh, MIT, she's a synthetic biology uh, professor out there and researcher. Um, I think she did an awesome job of really breaking down um, genetics in a way that I haven't seen described before. So I highly encourage you to check that out. And every summer she has teacher PD workshops across the country. Um, CASE curriculum is, uh, stands for Curriculum for of Ag Science Educators. Um, again, talks about everything from animal science to plant science to ag mechanics. 
Um, project Lead the Way, sorry I got happy with the T clearly. Um, they have a, a newer um, a newer pathway that focuses on environmental sustainability. Um, and they actually have a whole lesson plan um, talking about BT corn and you're able to grow BT corn in your classroom and um, uh, they also provide you with, with the larvae too. Um, grow Next Gen is another teacher professional development program based out of Ohio. Um, if you'd like to check that out. A couple of interactive activities. We've got Journey of a Gene. Um, it's, I personally really like it because it does a good job of having sort of like a, a knowledge stop in between each of the activities so that your students can continue to stay engaged and ask questions. Um, the University of Nebraska-Lincoln also has a, an awesome section in their plant and soil science uh, department just explaining everything from PCR to what is back crossing um, uh, to how to make a transgenic crop in their animation section. Um, Discovery Education and USFRA, which stands for United States Farmers and Ranchers Alliance, uh, they've done a really good job of creating some curriculum that goes along with the documentary farmland. A couple of videos to check out. Uh, there's a group called League of Nerds, and they did an interview with a now retired Monsanto scientist uh, named Dr. Fred Perlott, who talks about some of the challenges um, when, it, when it came to launching BT cotton uh, in India and how um, cotton was actually transformed. Uh, Larry did a, did a uh, Skeptics in the Pub. If you haven't heard of Skeptics in the Pub, typically every major city has a Skeptics group. Um, they meet in various bars around the city and they talk science. Um, so he was invited one time in Cambridge to talk about his job and um, talk about GMOs. Again, Food Evolution documentary. A um, couple of websites listed here. Um, social media groups. So this Ag Education Discussion Lab uh, is a private group, but if you um, request to be added, I highly suggest it. They are um, sharing lesson plans, open source. They are talking about best practices for the classroom. Um, you really get to collaborate with other teachers around the country who are doing pretty remarkable things in their classroom. Um, a public forum is this biotech in your brain. Um, and then lastly, uh, there was about a three-hour session uh, with Dr. Fred, Fred Perlas asking anything on Reddit. So AMA stands for asking anything. Okay. So we were sort of we were sort of worried that this might happen, but we actually only have about seven minutes for questions. Um, like I had mentioned, uh, Lisa has, has stepped out. However, Larry and I are here to answer your questions. Um, I've noticed a lot of the questions on the thread have to do with crop protection um, and pesticide usage, uh, application rates, things like that. Um, I encourage you to tune in to our third of uh, our third part of this five-part series on November 15th, because that's when we're going to be talking specifically about crop protection in agriculture. So we will have um, a weed scientist, we will have a chemist, we will have an environmental toxicologist um, cover those topics in depth. Um, as Larry mentioned, his background is in molecular biology. My background is more so in education and, and biology. So we, we may not be the ones that are um, most fit to answer those questions. However, we will definitely follow up. All right, so um, Carolyn, if, if you'd like to gather some questions for us. Thank you, Valerie. Um, uh, there were a lot of questions earlier about uh, numbers. It was things like, uh, you know, 10, 10 plants, uh, you know, those kinds of things. I think there was a little bit of confusion about just exactly how many GMO crops are out there. Could you address that? Yeah, I saw that question. It's a good question. And, um, and I can see how there's, you know, the way we talked about it could be a little confusing. So um, there's 10 different types of plants that have been um, modified in, in a GMO way. That's what Lisa showed. But I think the question talked about, you know, is, is it just one BT? Is it just one Roundup Ready? Um, so, for example, just for corn itself, 
there are a number of different types of varieties of Bt corn in that they have different Bt genes in them uh, from both us, Monsanto, and other companies. Uh, then a number of, of uh, GMO corns with different resistances to different herbicides. And then there are corns that have different combinations of those. Um, and so if you think about it that way, there are many different sort of subclasses of GMO corn, but they're all GMO, and many of them are either have a BT gene or an herbicide tolerance gene. Um, I, I hope that answers the question, at least the one that I saw. Yeah, that's great. Thank you so much, Larry. And Larry and Valerie, we're going to go ahead now and um, thank everybody for coming. So I'd like to thank today's presenters, Valerie Bays, Larry Gilbertson, and Lisa Canase. Thank you so much for sharing your experiences and expertise for this webinar this evening. Thank you also to Monsanto for sponsoring today's program. I should do the slides as I'm going along. I apologize. Um, also, just really quickly want to mention that we had put our Twitter handles underneath our name, so if we did not get to your question, feel free to tweet at us. Um, like I said, this is one of a five-part series, so feel free to tune back in. Um, hopefully, we can pace ourselves a little bit more ideally so we have room for more questions. But also, um, you know, if, you, uh, if you're going to the national conference, we'll have a booth there to make ourselves available. Um, if you email stemeducation.outreach at monsanto.com, I can follow up with any questions you may have. Um, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Valerie. And I'd also like to thank the administration of NSTA for their support for web seminars.